Hello, welcome to today's webinar on WordPress plugins and themes. Okay, so I usually introduce the uh, webinars by introducing the artwork behind me. So this is a piece that I installed in the Tarkine. It's part of Tarkine in Motion as part of the Bob Brown Foundation. So basically this was installed in a, a Keyfeld logging coop in these magical, mystical, amazing ecosystems. So basically clear fell it and then they um, wait till it dries, they drop na napalm on it and charges around the edge and they burn it, put in uh, monocultures. So this was built using tent waste from festivals, uh, it's the colorful stuff. And then also the actual wood and scrap that was left around as part of the carnage. So this, this webinar is about plugins and themes and I'll be talking more about the, 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 the construct around plugins. And then next session, I'll be talking more about specific plugins and recommended plugins and use, use case and all that sort of stuff. Um, so this, this webinar is more, yeah, talking about managing and finding them and all that sort of stuff. So let's start with the real basics. What is a webinar? Uh, what is a plugin? So a plugin is simply to increase functionality with the WordPress. So if you think of it like an app on your phone, uh, it just, it will increase the functionality of your phone and allows you to do lots of different um, bits and pieces. Now plugins are really important for something like WordPress because there's such a large number of plugins. If you try to add so much functionality into your WordPress, then it will just overwhelm it and it'll be very buggy, um, inefficient piece of software. So WordPress has what is called the core software. And this is the basic software that WordPress feels are the minimum to make things work. So you store that, install that, and then WordPress will work. Now the reason, um, and that code base is heavily audited and heavily managed to make sure that it's bug free and that it works really well. And then from there you plug in various functionality, all the different things that you need to do um, to what you need. And we'll go through that in quite a lot of detail in this session. Uh, some plugins are very minimal and hidden. So for example, to switch on the classic editor, uh, it's simply you install the plugin and that's it. You don't have to touch anything. It just does a little bit in the background. Some, some plugins are full on uh, override what your, what your um, functionality is doing. Okay, so the Australia map project, uh, this is mapping the nuclear sites of Australia. This is using a plugin which overrides the entire site functionality. So instead of it being a blog or a website, it's now a mapping software. And in this, this context, you can click on a specific place and it'll log you, take you through to uh, the different um, sites. So this is the WordPress repository where all the free plugins are, are put. Uh, and this, uh, the great thing about the WordPress repository is that it actually, they audit the software for Trojan horses, for viruses, uh, minimum amount of quality, those sort of things. So to install a WordPress, uh, to install a plugin using the WordPress repository, I've just logged into a WordPress website that I installed for the WordPress basics session that I did. So I assume that you're a little bit familiar with WordPress at this point. So we go to plugins down here, and then add new plugin. Now, if you search here, this is the WordPress repository. So everything in here is on that WordPress repository. The other way to install a plugin is if you've um, bought a plugin from somewhere, then you'd come, you download that plugin from the site where you've bought it from. Then you click upload, choose file and install it that way. From there, you usually need to license it, put a license code or something like that. Now, if a, if a plugin is free and it's not on the WordPress repository, I'd be very suspicious of it. Because if you're running a free plugin, it just makes sense to put it on the repository. And if, you, if you're a user, you, you'd want it on the repository. So if, if it's not on the repository, it could have Trojan horses, it could have viruses and that sort of thing. If it's a really simple uh, plugin and it's from someone you trust, then that's okay. But generally 
don't install free plugins that have just come from random places on the internet. Same with paid plugins. Make sure that the company you're buying it off is reputable. If you are um, sourcing your plugins through alternative means, then you need a way of trusting those plugins or being able to audit them yourself. So I wanted to talk a little bit about actual how plugins are structured as far as payments and management of the software and that sort of stuff. Because WordPress is free, as in free beer, so it doesn't cost you anything. It's also free as in freedom. That is that you can access the code, you can you can do, you can remix the code, you can make copies of the code, you can do anything you'd like with the code. The only restrictions of that is that you need to then, if you are developing in that, that you release your code under the same platform. So that means that all the themes and plugins in WordPress are open source. So if they're paid, they're still open source. So a lot of the plugins that come with WordPress are free, or well, they may be by donation. So in that context, they're using the WordPress repository, as I mentioned earlier. If they're paid plugins, they are also open source. What they usually charge for is they pay for access. So it's not published anywhere that's easily to get on the internet. So you may have to pay the licensing fees so you can actually download the software. Generally though, what they're really paying for is updates and support. So that allows you to, to sync up the plugin to your WordPress and the update system. So when updates come, then you can automatically update. And this is really uh, key for your security and that sort of stuff. The other key component of a paid plugin model is the support. So you're having problems, they'll usually have a support system that they'll then let you access so you can um, keep going with that. So some, uh, some um, paid models will be that you pay, you pay a fee and it's once off fee and you get unlimited uh, updates and then you pay for the support structure. Or maybe they'll charge you for a monthly or yearly subscription, that sort of stuff. Another approach to paid um, plugins is memberships or bundles. So in that case, they'll give you access to their website where they've got a collection of lots of different plugins where you can then access all those. I'm not usually a fan of those because I generally, um, uh, I'm usually, and I'll talk about how to find plugins a little later, I'm usually specifically looking for a specific plugin and I'm judging it on its merits. I'm not usually looking at a plugin that um, just because I'm in a member of a website and I've got a plugin for something, I'm not necessarily going to use that. Now there are exceptions to that. Um, for example, the security and backup plugin I use is from the same company and that's bought in a bundle uh, or my theme and then various uh, uh, upgrades to that theme are also part of one bundle. So a lot of the pricing models are pay per site per year. Sometimes they'll charge for multiple sites per year. This is a bit annoying if you've only got one, one site and they're charging you for three site license. Um, as a developer, I tend to buy developers licenses which will give me unlimited access. So then if I'm building lots of websites that allows me to um, install them on all my websites. Uh, some plugins are just one-off payments. So you just pay once. Uh, Advanced Custom Fields is an example of that, which is a really uh, powerful developer plugin. So you just pay once and then free updates, free support forever. Um, another key approach, and I've talked about this in previous webinars, is freemium. So where that is, is that they give you a very good quality plugin with limited features, and then you pay for more upgrades. So Elementor a Page Builder is a good example of that. Now it's, re it's really uh, useful to think of freemium on a spectrum. So on one end of the spectrum, you've got a really good tool that works for most people for free. It's got heaps of functionality and it, it works really well. So Yoast SEO is a really good example of that as a plugin. Uh, it's a great tool and for free. Uh, and then a, sm a select number of pro users I don't know, maybe 5% of users would then pay for the premium services and all the extras. On the other hand, you have software which is freemium, but then it doesn't really work without the features that are paid. So the features they give you, they don't have the key features that you'd actually make the tool usable. So they sort of pretend it's free to use it, but it's not really usable. And then you need to pay to, to upgrade. So HubSpot's an interesting one in that context for CRMs when I was doing the research. 
you you can only you've got such a limited number of users you can use on the free free plan that it actually makes the free plan um, not for, like irrelevant. Yet they will, they all their marketing and their promotion is around this is a free tool, this is a free tool. So it's just to get you in, get using the tool, and then they start charging you more. So there's two ends of the spectrum for freemium business models. So just make sure when you're looking at those that you're looking and making sure that if you're wanting a free plugin that the features you you need are free um, or you're willing to pay. Another approach is what WooCommerce use, which is a famous uh, e-commerce uh, plugin for WordPress, which is owned by WordPress. And the core software that makes WooCommerce works is free, but then they charge you for various plugins. So one plugin that they charge for is the Australian Post um, measure. Uh, the, so you can plug into the Australian Post the distance calculator. So you can put a postcode in and the weight, and then you can calculate the costs of shipping. So if you're an Australian distributor, that's you know a essential plugin unless you've got flat shipping. So therefore, you know I think that's seventy dollars for to pay for that premium plugin. Uh, however, it's, it's cheap overall. So now I'm going to go through the process of selecting plugins because this is really um, is actually quite complex, and um, years of experience have refined this process for me. And um, so, yeah, I just want to show how I approach the selecting plugins. Because if we go to the WordPress repository, there are 56,000 plugins. I'm just reading 56,287 plugins. Now, that's the free ones just on the repository, plus there's thousands of hundreds of thousands of paid plugins. So, how do we actually find and select the right ones? So, the first thing you want to start with is a brief. Now, if, if you work with me, pretty much most questions you ask me will end up, will, will be replied with what's your brief. Uh, whether you're building a big, big website or just a small bit of functionality, you really want to understand what you're doing. And obviously a budget as well. So you might say, I want all free plugins. Or you might say, look, I've got a couple hundred bucks to spend on plugins. Or you might say, I, I don't really want to spend money on plugins. However, if this plugin is really good, um, it's far better than the competitors, then sure, I'll pay some money. So you want an idea about, about that. Generally, if you're doing any sort of business functionality or anything that's raising money, then the cost of your plugin should more be calculated over an annual cost versus how much it's making back. Uh, if it makes it much easier to make a donation, then therefore the cost will pay for itself in a, in a period of time. Now, briefs also really important because an example that I like to use is we're that I will use is we're going to be looking for a calendar plugin. Now, there's lots of calendar plugins, so we're not going to just look for a calendar plugin. Do you want what do you want your calendar for? Are you booking tickets? Are you displaying events on your website? Is it for booking appointments? There, or is it for um, booking events? I mean, these are all very different uh, case scenarios uh, and there's so many uh, calendar plugins to, to choose from. There's a lot of different business models as well. So in that case, you've really got to work out exactly what you need from that plugin before you can even start searching for it. So in that context, um, if it's a calendar plugin, your brief might look like, I want to be able to make appointments, um, people can book online, they can book at a certain time, there's various people that we can book, um, there's various rates that they may be able to choose from or various services they can choose from, et cetera, et cetera. So you're writing all the things that you need to work out. Now in previous webinars, we talked about pathways and user journeys. Now this is really key to have that in place. That's in previous webinars. You're working out how you want your user to navigate from when they first see you online, maybe Facebook to, to your website, to actually making a sale or donation or, or some sort of action. So you need that in place before you start thinking about what is the process you want for your plugins and then you can work out, okay, I need a plugin to do, to do this. Then the next thing that we do, uh, research. Now the great news is it, there's plenty of nerds out there that has, that has done this for you. So I'm going to just jump to here. I'm going to search for, let's go for calendar. I know, well, let's make an appointment because that's my more specific brief. Appointment. Top 10 WordPress appointment plugins. So here we go. This, uh, oh, and you generally want to be looking at the date as well. 
Um, so I could put in 2020 there. So this first one is six best appointment and booking plugins, 10 best appointment booking plugins, 20 best of booking appointment. So if we scroll down this entire page, what we've got is all these people that have reviewed the plugins, shortlisted them, tested them, and written a review on them. That saves you doing it, right? So let's just look at, I'm just gonna jump through the top three. So now that we've got it, we've, we've got these done, we want to then, look, we're looking for two things while we're scrolling through here. So if I just scroll through here, okay, what kind of appointment and booking form do you want? But here we go, so start booking, as an example, they've got a screenshot, they've got a bit of a description uh, down here. This blog has a bit of a description and a screenshot, a bit of a description and a screenshot. So this is what you want to sort of look at. What we're looking for is, is um, patterns. And what you'll notice is that a lot of the blogs will start recommending specific, specific applications. So last time I did this research for a client, Amelia kept coming up. Um, this is number three on this one. Um, this one here was number one. And I'm not sure if it's on this one. So that's a pattern that I was looking for. And so when I went and look, looked at Amelia in detail, I found that it had a very slick user interface and I was really impressed with that. And that ended up being the one that I recommended. Now, also with these descriptions, we're also looking at what functionality, because you've got your brief. So you want to, by reading these descriptions quickly, does this hit my brief or not? So you're shortlisting, um, will these plugins reach the functionality that you need for your brief? Then you're looking for patterns of what's, what's the most recommended app out there. So from there, you'll be getting uh, your shortlist, your, your um, lists that you, that you want. Oh, it's just stop share. So at that point, you've, you've um, shortlisted your plug your plugins at this point you may have 10 you may have five ish uh, you depending on what functionality you're doing and also how many are out there now in a case scenario where there's only one plugin that does what you need then well you've chosen that plugin by default um, however it's ideally you've got a bit of a choice so first thing is if you've got if you've got a free plugin what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump to the WordPress repository and if it's a free plugin, it'll be on here. So maybe I'll just search for calendar. So hypothetically, just say that we've chosen these three um, calendars. So now I'm going to then show you some of the things that I'm looking for to help shortlist them again. Let's just jump down to here on the right. We'll go advanced view and we'll do that for all of them. And advanced view. We'll look at these statistics. Okay, first statistic we want to look at is updates. Is this updated regularly? Because uh, WordPress is very vulnerable um, if it's not maintained well. So you really want a plugin that's updated for security regularly. It's also great to just have bug fix fixes and updates and um, various improvements. So this is two months ago. This one was updated a week ago. This one was three days ago. So that's pretty good. I mean, two months generally isn't too bad, depending on what it's doing. If it's a core a plug in, like something like a booking calendar, you, you at least six months will probably be maximum you're looking at. If it's just a simple functionality, then a bit longer. If it hasn't been updated in two years, you'd be, um, unless it's the perfect plugin, you wouldn't be um, wanting to use it. If it's older than three years, WordPress generally doesn't show up in the searches. So you don't really um, want to use that. Uh, updates, active installations. So this is how many websites have actually installed it. So it's a bit like a vote. This one's got 60,000. This one's got 50,000. This one's got 800,000. So in this context, the events calendar is um, the far popular one. Now, none of, none of these things I'm talking about uh, reasons to choose one or the other they're just criteria so as they add up in an aggregated view so the events calendar I've used before it's a freemium plugin um, I've obviously got enough functionality that people like the free stuff so then a lot of people installing the free one the other um, thing you want to look at is the support so we're coming down to here support 42 out of 195 
So they're not supporting it that much. Let's have a look down here, 99 out of 124. So yeah, they're supporting a lot more. This is if you've got, got issues with it. And 19 out of 19. So that's if that means that they're not getting a lot of problems and they're, they're helping them. So that's uh, looking at a good thing. Now, the thing with um, this one is because it's freemium, we know that one of the things that, that they supply commercially is support. So you may, may consider paying for the paid version because then you'll get support. Um, and that's I think so you really need to look at how much support you have got and the other thing that's really uh, useful is if we click development um, and let's look at this one as well is how many developers are working on it how many contributors so here we've got a whole pile of contributors these are people that uh, work on the code base that's quite a lot um, and I think a lot of those would be modern tribe staff, but that'd also be volunteers as well. Um, this one here, there's one contributor, which is a company. And this one here has got two. Now, the problem with having one developer, especially for some of the smaller plugins, is that if that person, life happens to them, you know, if they get sick or injured, or maybe they just, um, don't want to use computers anymore and they abandon that project that means there's not going to be any updates so if you've got multiple developers actively working on it and one of the developers um, pulls out then generally there'll be other other developers that will help work for help jump in on it um, so ideally you want more than one developer for a plugin okay so once you've gone through your um, blog posts and you've um, shortlisted them then you've gone through some of these uh, criteria that I've looked at then uh, ideally then you've got two or three plugins which are really standing out at that point you install them and then you test them and I'm not going to go in this webinar step by step on how to configure a plugin because every plugin is different and so in that context you have to learn how it works so ideally it's a uh, intuitive plugin so in that case um, you should be able to figure it out and if it's not an intuitive plugin, then you want to hope that they've got good documentation so that it will help you figure it out. Now, if it's really super hard to figure out, then it's probably not a very good plugin anyway. So I'm not going to actually go through um, specifically how to uh, install specific plugins. Uh, in the next webinar, I will go in a bit more detail, but still it's important also to know that the settings and the way pl um, plugins and themes work changes regularly. So I could show you step by step, but then it might be different um, next time you go in to do that. Okay, so if it's a paid plugin, it's a very similar approach. Um, now, especially if it's freemium. So if it's freemium, you can check the WordPress repository and go through those things. Now, if it's not a freemium, if it's not on the WordPress repository, then you want to review their business model. Um, look at what are the costs it's going to cost you. Um, and I talked about the business models before. I mean, what is the total cost of this? And also what is the viability? Like if you're investing in a major plugin for your business, for your business or organization, you really want to make sure that that the company is going to be in business in the long term. You don't want them going broke. So in that case, you want to look at, try and figure out, is this company a sustainable company in the long term? Because I'm going to invest a lot of time and, and effort trying to get this plugin working and running my website. And I don't want it just to have to replace that in six months. Now with the free plugins, you can try them. And if you don't like them, uh, so in that context, you, you install three plugins and then work out which one works best for you. So if you can't do that, if you don't have the option to try it, then have a look at what their refund policy is or trial period. A lot of plugins will offer a free trial or they'll offer a money back guarantee for 15 days. Some of them don't offer a ref refund at all. Um, in that case, if you install it, it doesn't do quite what you want or it's not intuitive, then you, know, you just lose your money. Um, so that's, that's something, a decision you need to look at. You also want to review the documentation and support. So if it's a paid plugin, then I would expect that they've got good support and they've got good documentation because ideally you don't want to contact support. If you've got a problem or you're trying to work out how to do something, you want to get, make sure they've got really good documentation so you can just get the thing done. Um, so that's quite important is how, how are they going to support it? And then, uh, reviewing the sales informa information. So this is just a matter of going to your 
going to the website, reading their sales spiel, um, seeing if, if that resonates with what you want. A lot of the times I'm looking at their sales website, seeing exactly what the functionality is and how that will actually work for me. At that point, then you purchase the plugin, then you download it and then you install it. So in the same way I showed you right at the start, you just go to the WordPress plugins, add new, upload, and then away you go. So now I'm going to just talk a little bit about once you've got the plugin, um, because plugins actually put things in lots of different spots. And so I'm going to jump to my WordPress. So one of the places where they'll put this, so the settings, what I mean is the configuration. So in that context, if there's things to set up on the plugin, so WooCommerce, for example, you want to be able to put your web, your postal address, those sort of things. So some plugins will create a new tab here. So that means they have a whole section um, that will just show you, that will sh I'll show you on this website. So in this context, Yoast SEO has its own um, tab, which has its own sub menu. Uh, same with Monster Insights, the security plugin or Divi, all these plugins have their own um, menu item. The other place to come and have a look is in settings. So in this case, duplicate page has some settings. Um, duplicate page, page navy has some settings in here. So you can find them in there. Another place that sometimes they'll put stuff is tools. So redirection is a plugin, for example, and that's hidden away under the tools. Generally they'll have their own um, tab or they'll be in settings. Tools is more for if you've, you've got something that's a bit more specific to how WordPress functions. Now, if you can't find anywhere where there's the settings or anything to fiddle with, it could be that they don't have any settings, so in which case you can review the website, their website or the repository. The other place to come and have a look is in the plugins and some themes will actually have a link directly to the settings. So in this context, um, this one's got a link to where you license it. This one's got a link to the settings here. Um, this one's got a link to documentation. So you can have a look there as well um, to find out where you configure it and those side of things. Okay, so plugins, setting and data. So I just want to talk a little bit about um, the actual data that plugins generate. So this is includes the settings, but if it's a booking calendar, it will actually create, it will store all the bookings and all that sort of stuff. So that information gets stored in the database. Um, and I won't go into much detail because um, that's getting more technical. However, all you need to think about is anything that's a setting, anything that's information or data gets put into your database. Now, when you disable plugins, so in this case, I can click the de deactivate button here, or if I jump back to this website, which isn't a live website and I won't break, so I could click on these and then also click deactivate, apply, and they'll deactivate them. Now, if a plugin is using best practice and not all plugins do, so uh, you, this, this isn't a guarantee what I'm about to discuss. However, if they've been coded correctly, if you disable the plugin, the data is still in the database. Now, this is really important because uh, when you're trying to debug, if you've got conflicts or problems with the plugin or theme, Generally what you do is you disable the plugins and try and isolate which one is happening. So you do actually switch off plugins, even if they're core plugin for your site. If you're a shop, you may have to disable WooCommerce, for example. So it's really important that when you switch it back on, that it's just gonna work as it was, as it was working. So in that context, um, it will still be in the database. However, if you delete the plugin, the best practice is that then that data is deleted off the database. So that means when you reinstall your plugin, then you've lost all your data and you need to start from scratch. Um, there are exceptions to that and I'm gonna show you right at the end how to force disable a plugin. That won't actually delete the data out of the database. And also a lot of plugins don't actually delete data and it becomes messy in your database. And that becomes something that's more of an advanced um, approach to try and clean up your database. Okay, do we have any questions about plugins and uh, managing plugins? 
we've been moving um, very fast through the, through the webinar, so I've got time for questions, if you've got any questions about um, that side of things. Okay, I'm going to keep going then. Now I'm going to introduce themes. Now theme, choosing the theme for your website um, is the most, one of the most important things that you're going to consider in that context. Um, and I'll explain why. I'll just jump up while you share the screen. Now the theme, there's a lot of quite different um, definitions of a theme. Uh, generally, it's the graphic design and the layout. So this is the aesthetics of your website. This is how many columns that it has. This is the layout where the logo goes. It's the fonts, it's the colors, it's all that sort of stuff. So graphic design, aesthetics. Now from a technical point of view, it's all these languages here. So I'm just gonna run through, uh, not too much detail, but just explain these different, um, different, um, approach, the different components. So the first one is we have HTML, and I spoke a lot more detail in the search optimization webinar about HTML. And I think, and I think when um, you're, if you're working on any websites, you should learn HTML. I've just got a question. Um, when you deactivate a plugin, um, are they deleted? Uh, when you deactivate a plugin, it's not deleted. They just stay right here in the repository. Uh, they stay here. So see there's these ones here that are white background uh, that's got activate. So what that means is that they're deactivated. So they're not doing anything, but they're just sitting there. Uh, at that point, if you deactivate plugins, the data is still in the database. If you remove the, the plugin, i.e. you click delete, in theory, it should delete the data, depending on the plugin. So um, just make sure that if you are going to de delete a plugin and you've got data, um, that you back up, back up your website. I mean, you should be backing up your website before you're playing with any sort of plugins and themes anyway, just in case something um, corrupts. So I just jump back to HTML. So HTML is the basic language of the of the internet, um, and it's also when you're editing web pages, it's the the content uh, your content is in HTML, and it's quite a simple language. We start start with a tag, and we have some content. We end with a tag. Um, I'm just going to introduce you this. So I'm not going to go into too much detail. CSS is a language that describes the style. So uh, fonts, colors, layouts, all that sort of stuff. And it's really, it's, it was really good when CSS um, started being used because it separates the HTML from the CSS, which has heaps of benefits. We also have JavaScript, and this is a programming language that you can use with HTML, which means that you can animate things, or if you've ever been to a web form and you've clicked it and it's automatically put in some content or it's done something tricky like that, that's going to be JavaScript. Now, the WordPress itself is using PHP. This is a programming language. Um, it's open source. So all these technologies are open source and free. And specifically WordPress is written in PHP, but it's got its own, um, own tags, its own templates, its own um, theming language. So in that context, I'm not going to, again, not going into much detail, but just to give you an idea that WordPress has its own language that's written in PHP, um, that then is using HTML, CSS, JavaScript. So yeah, if you're interested in actually creating your own um, themes, then that would be the languages that you would need to learn. In that context, um, JavaScript comes in libraries, so you won't need to use that too much. Um, PHP, you generally wouldn't need to learn that in detail, but you would need to learn HTML and CSS in detail and WordPress templating in detail. Okay, so one of the analogies that I use about what a theme is, is if you think of a car. So the WordPress core and the plugins, so WordPress is the core software, the, the, does the minimum package and the plugins is the motor, is the engine of the car. And the theme is everything else. So by everything else, I, I say that it's the gearbox. It, it's how, how the user uses the gear stick to control that motor. 
is the steering wheel and the indicators and how, how do you steer the car. It's also the styling. You know, is it is it got smooth lines like a Ferrari or is it more of a pickup Jeep? What colour is it? Um, where do you have the headlights, headlight design? So if you think of a car, all the, the majority of the car, um, the motor is only one component of the car. Although the car won't work without a motor and the whole point of it is a motor. So WordPress is the motor and the plugins are the motor um, and the theme is everything else. So you can think of it like that. So that's why I'd repeat that. Um, the themes uh, is such a key decision when choosing your website and what theme to to actually implement. Okay, so themes as much as you have, there's the aesthetic. So in theory, you have a separation between. Um, so in theory, with themes, you have a, a um, separation between the aesthetic. And the functionality but it's not that simple so a lot of themes come with functionality which would be equivalent to a plugin so there's a few ways of looking at this uh, and the functionality might be um, you know a booking calendar it might have one built in yeah so the way they may approach it is that that calendar is actually built into the actual theme core or they may have set, they may separate it out so that there's a plugin that does the calendar, might be the same company that does it, and then the theme works together. Um, some themes will then have required plugins, so they're plugins that they must use, and then they'll have some optional plugins. So there's, there's a marriage between uh, relationships between the plugins and the theme, depending on how the theme's coded and how it's structured. What are the pros and cons of having an individualized custom built theme versus off the shelf one? That's the question. I'm gonna actually get, get to that um, and go into a bit more detail about the pros and cons of an individual theme. Um, okay, so that's sort of the idea of what a theme is in context of WordPress. So now I'm gonna talk about where to find themes. So the free themes um, are the WordPress repository, which I showed you. So there's free and freemium themes on there. Now there's another concept which are boundaries or theme producing companies. So these are companies that just focus purely on making themes. So here's some examples um, here. It'll make, make more sense if I show it to you. So Elegant um, is a company that makes lots of themes. Now generally I find that um, themes that are made by a foundry are high quality because they generally will be a group of people rather than one person. And that this is their business and their business model. So they'll, they'll be striving to make high quality themes. They'll be um, also supporting and managing those. So they'll be running, making their themes like a business. And they're also more likely to be around in the long term and update their themes. And generally, as they build themes for many years, they get really good at it. And then they start bringing some of the, the knowledge um, from working on the old themes on the new themes. Uh, another example is Blue Chick, and I find this uh, is a good example. So they specialize in building themes for women, the female entrepreneurs. So that's sort of what they're focusing on. And so they've got a whole bunch of different themes, and um, this is th what they think um, female entrepreneurs would, would look for. So there's a few different themes here. Um, and I've got a whole library of themes. And in this context, um, it's a couple that run it. Um, so it's nice. And, and then they've got a, like a whole, whole bunch of stuff. Now, uh, the good thing about this one is they also have, um, as well as the themes, they have Canva templates, which is great for um, your campaigns. Um, Canva is a great tool. WordPress themes, um, they also have a um, relationship with the stock photography. So you can also buy the stock photography that they're using in these themes as well as the themes. Uh, this foundry are uh, producing themes specifically for photographers. So if we have a look at these, you'll see they're very clean, focused on image. So if you're a photographer, I'd recommend um, looking at these themes. So in summary, you'll notice that these different companies have specializations and they're making high quality themes for those specific um, genres. 
Now, the other place to find themes is um, a marketplace. So if you think of a marketplace like a shopping mall of themes. So Envato is the biggest one, and this was born in Melbourne. Uh, they're the biggest in the world. Now, I find this website awful to be able to navigate and actually find themes. Um, however, they have um, 447,000 WordPress themes and website templates. So there's like quite a lot on there. Um, it's just a matter of trying to find them. Now in this shopping center, you'll have theme foundries that are selling through here because they'll do the finance side of the, the transaction. You'll get a lot of small independent people. You'll have some really low end, bad quality stuff, people trying to make a buck. And then you've got some really high end polished quality themes. So they're the sort of uh, main places where you'll buy themes from. Okay, so now I'm gonna um, talk about some of the approaches to themes. Um, I couldn't think of a better title. Um, so one of the concepts to think about is code bloat. And a lot of professional developers will be very critical of off the shelf themes because they say it's full of code bloat. What code bloat is, is where you've got heaps of bells and whistles and heaps of functionality, but you're only using a little bit of it. So if, you're, if the majority of your website code isn't being used, it's just bloat, it's just a waste. So a lot of um, off the shelf themes will have a lot of code bloat. Now that can be minimized by a good optimization of your website. However, if you've, if you've got a very specialist use for your website, then you would also question like, would, is that the right approach um, to have such a bloated one? The default WordPress themes. So WordPress comes with, um, they start with 20. So 2010, 2012, 2013, all the way up to 2020 is their latest one. So these are the, the themes that ship with WordPress. They're called default. Now they're, they're useful in the fact that they're, we consider them bulletproof in the context that they're heavily audited by the people who make the WordPress code. And so they're near guaranteed to work with WordPress. So if you're having problems with your theme and you want to test, is my theme causing problems? You can then put WordPress um, 2020 in store and um, then you can see if the functionality is working or not. If the, if the problem still were, is still with 2020, then you assume that it's not the theme, it's some other problem. Now I find that the 2020 themes are generally pretty uh, awful and um, yeah, very rare I would use them standalone. The Australian map project that I showed you first up, um, that is using 2012, I think. Um, that's probably the only WordPress default theme I've used, but that's also been heavily customized because we've adapted that to a map. And in that context, it made sense to use 2012 because we were also Wanted, wanted a long-term theme for the, for, we wanted minimum code, all that sort of stuff. Now, a custom coded theme. So this is where we write a theme from scratch. So this is best practice. And in an ideal world, this is what you would do. Now, in an ideal world, you probably don't have four to $20,000, $50,000 to code one. Um, so, if, but the benefits of uh, custom coded is it's coded specifically for you. It's very lightweight as far as code bloat. So I made a theme for Stereosonic, which is was the largest music festival in Australia. And that needed to, in the lead up to the, to the festival, transact 80,000 ticket sales uh, a day. So high traffic, um, they had, I think it was roundabout, don't quote me on this, but it was like $80,000 just on the hosting for that month. So it's a huge, huge cost to keep this thing alive. So any inefficiencies at all with that code meant that the, it costs more in hosting and it, it put pressure on all the booking systems. So we needed it as lean as possible. So that theme that I built, every line of code was audited, like every line in the entire build, um, all the JavaScripts, all the HTML, all the CSS was heavily audited. And we're just looking at how do we cut Cut, cut. But that's also a $25,000 process. Now, in a, in a context where we're shooting out numbers, 80,000 here and 80,000 people and, you know, a million dollars worth of ticket sales, $25,000 is 
is a really good use of money when you're trying to make a very fast, efficient, and we're talking about building a Formula One race car here. Um, that makes sense. Now, if you're a small business or not-for-profit organization, that's just silly. Like, it's just dumb. Like, why would you build a custom team? Uh, unless you're um, moving lots of traffic, um, it's, it's just not a really good use of your money. If, you, if you're moving lots of traffic or if you've got a specific application, so just say you're developing software and it's doing something very specific, then of course you'd want to custom build the code that wraps that for many efficient reason, efficiency reasons and that sort of stuff. So the next approach is what we call off the shelf. So this is where we, we grab a theme or buy a theme that's already built, um, which is the most approach. So in that context, when I showed you the theme foundries, you go, yeah, I really like that theme. You'd buy it, you'd download it, you'd install it, and you're happy. So yeah, you got a bit of code bloat, but really for the, the performance impacts are just completely minimal. And if you're a low traffic site, it's, it's completely irrelevant. Um, yes, not best practice to the <laughs> fancy developers. However, it's, um, it's uh, you know, you've just saved yourself a huge amount of money that you can then spend on actually running your campaign. Now, one of my key uh, jobs as a website builder um, a couple of years ago, was would be customizing off the shelf. So this is a, a mix where we get an off the shelf theme and go, that's roughly what we want. Uh, we want to change this, we want to change that. So then I would then code that theme to, to do that. So that was pretty much most of what my work involved using um, CSS and the PHP templating languages, I'd, I'd customize it. Now, if we're using a really heavy um, software coding from scratch or we're doing heavy customization then what we usually will do is start with what we call base theme starter theme so this is a very minimal theme that just has the basic structure of um, the basic templating language it has uh, some basic styling but not much at all because we want to minimize that code bloat and from there we build on top of it so we can also use the 2020 theme or the 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 various WordPress themes for that. So the Australian map process was an example where I grabbed the 20, 2012 theme, I used that as a starter theme, and then I did some coding on top. That means that I had very low code bloat because the 2020, 2012 theme is very efficient. I'm putting a little bit of styling on top. So it's quite an efficient way of doing that. Um, <clears throat> but the reason we were mainly doing that is to make the, um, the map software as efficient as possible. And by efficient, it was more about the layout and how, how it actually worked. Um, so yeah, the pros and cons of having an individual built theme versus um, off the shelf. Yeah, I really think if you're big traffic and you're all your specialist use, then you, you custom code. Or if you just got money to waste. Um, otherwise, I'd be looking at um, an off the shelf theme However, a theme that is, that's is got less code bloat, less complexity as possible. Now, I've adapted my entire production process in the last 12 months. And I, my, my main business income is now, I just don't sell that service anymore. And that was customizing off the shelf themes. What I'm using now is I'm using page builders. Um, specifically, I'm using Divi. Now, what this allows us to do is we install the theme and then we can just customize it without coding. So even though I'm trained and fluent in coding and I can code a Formula One race car, um, I've, I've stopped doing it because I specialize in working with small groups, um, not-for-profit groups, small business, people that don't have much money. And in that context, it's far more cheaper and efficient to grab a page builder um, and then we can just build it. Um, so the Action Skills website that we're looking at at the moment is built um, in Divi. The other exciting thing that this leads to, and this was the last two builds that I did commercially, was that I, I install a development website. I give my clients some training. Um, so the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, the Australian, um, we built a new site specifically for Australia. So basically I gave training to Jem and Jem's a very smart person. She um, converted her ute to run on veggie oil. So sure she could figure out websites. So I, I had two hours training with her. 
she went and built the website. Um, she came back with all the hard bits and pieces. I spent another two hours with her roughly. Uh, I think I fixed one or two things that were really hard and then done. So as far as budgets, we're looking at in the old days, four grand to build a website. We're now under a thousand bucks. Not only that, the client then walks away and can actually build their website. Like they don't need me in that context. What they'd come back to me for is, um, you know, to help them with more advanced stuff and um, helping them. So I'm shifting my entire business models and everything I'm doing to, um, to more looking at holistic approaches to digital campaigning. So now that you've just saved three grand on building a website, which, which you used to spend on building your themes and templates, we can now look at go, how do we now build our, build our movements, install CRMs, um, set up our social media, that sort of stuff. So we're actually growing our campaigns. So digital now for me is gone from building websites, building whole marketing systems. And this is not costing, this is costing less overall, which is really exciting. Um, the cost of websites have plummeted. Now, this is also one of the benefits of WordPress. So if you're in a system like Nation Builder, they don't have page builders. So you, you now still need to, to hand build all your themes in Nation Builder. So if you're using Nation Builder and you wanna, you wanna customize, you're looking at four grand up to 10 grand to code your website in Nation Builder versus you can pay for Divi 70 bucks off the shelf and you can build a website. Um, so this is um, a really exciting thing that's happened in the last 12 months. Um, and I'll be doing a whole webinar on Divi and showing you how I'm building using those tools. And the exciting thing is that um, people can just learn it. Oh, you don't need to be a coder anymore. Um, so I've gone from probably 40% to 50% custom code on a website. I'm down to probably 2% code. So I'm, I'm coding a website like 2% now which is exciting. Uh, I only learned code because I had to and you guys don't learn it anyway. Although you may want to learn it, that's up to you. Okay. So now I'm going to talk a bit about what I, what I call an old approach, but it's still relevant because there are a lot of case scenarios where you will get um, an off the shelf and a page builder isn't appropriate. So for example, I showed you the, um, the photography themes you you if you're a photographer you might just go this works this is perfect i don't need to build anything i'm i'm just gonna put a bio up i'm literally got one page so it doesn't make sense to use a page builder if you're a photographer if if those off the shelf themes already work so i'm not not writing off off the shelf that's still relevant in this model um i'm just generally for most websites now i'm using page builders so off the shelf, I mentioned minimal sites, uh, min minimal code structures. So that in that case would be the 2020 themes, but there are a lot of um, good minimal themes out there. Um, as far as, and by that, I mean code base. I'm not talking about aesthetics. And uh, a minimal design aesthetic is also something I'm a fan of, but I'm also gonna say that's separate from graphic design, which is a minimal to um, the actual code structure. Then the other approach is having more functionality or aesthetic by one group. So that means that, you know, you've gone from just a, a basic website and then you're going to um, have more aesthetic. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll have a break at three o'clock. Um, so I'll just go through the section, then we'll have a break. Um, so we have the more functionality or aesthetic by one group. So in that context, that would be um, like the, the blue chick that we sh that I showed you. Uh, oh, sorry, the photography website. Um, also content licensing. So some themes um, come with images and pictures that you can already use. So if you're just sort of slapping together a site, you might be slapping together a really quick one. You might be able to get an off the shelf one that already has stock photography ready for you and you can just off you go. Um, so the, the women's uh, entrepreneur websites I showed you, you can then, you can pay for the website. I think they're like 40 bucks or 60 bucks for the website uh, theme. And then you can pay another 60 bucks, 80 bucks for the imagery. But for, for like 200 bucks or 100, $200, you're going to have a really high end polished graphic design with high end polished photography and you'll look a million bucks. Okay, so I'm gonna start by talking about mashups. And what I mean by mashup 
is that it's a collection of a heap of plugins in a collection uh, which makes a theme that does all the bells and whistles. So I'm going to jump to the repository to the sorry the theme marketplace of Vardo. So this is where we've got 47,000 themes and I'm going to jump to their 20 best 2020 best selling themes and I hate these all. I hate these a lot. I don't explain why. Um, Avada is the number one selling theme of all time on Theme Forest. And um, it's awful um, to use. So the pros of it is great if you have no experience. Um, and it does all the things. It allows These were the first generation that allowed non-technical people, non-coding people to start building their own websites. And that's great. But um, the problems are, and I'll go through what I think the problems with this approach are. Okay, so the issue that a lot of these, the, especially the big seller ones on um, Envato, are that they have a million bells and whistles. So you'll have a look at like some of the marketing here, you know, 50, 50 plus full websites, 200 template blocks, 40 elements. Um, so they're just packed full with all the things that they do. The um, and you'll see all these big, big numbers and all that sort of stuff. And so this works more, these are optimized to sell themes, not so much optimized to be themes, if that makes sense. So if, so people are looking for very, they, they people that haven't actually done a, a brief, like I'm recommending that you do, they come in and they just see all these different things that they could be and they just, it, they get overwhelmed and they go, yeah, this is awesome, I'm gonna buy this. Um, so one of the issues that we have is what I call less less than optimal plugins. So when when themes use commercial plugins, what they'll do is they'll relicense them. So they're like a bundle of relicensed software. So in this specific case, they've got an easy to use page builder. Now what they're using is a tool called WP Bakery. Now WP Bakery was one of the early drag and drop um, page builders. So it was a wonderful tool for its day and age. It's now an outdated antique and compared to Divi or Elementor and the more th modern theme builders, it's an awful, awful experience. Um, so this theme calls it the easy to use one. I was looking at some other um, themes uh, in this category and now one of them said it's the best, easiest to use, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's using an outdated, um, crappy um, theme, uh, sorry, plugin, and they're doing that because they'll get a better licensing deal. This is worth uh, 60 bucks, and if you think, you know, if it's to license WP Bakery, it might be $4, and to license Elementor, it might be $8. So that point, that really cuts into their profit motive. So generally, these bundles will be using what is the best value to bundle, not necessarily what the best plugins are. I think that's really important, especially a page builder, which is such a key uh, element. Um, WP Breaker is annoying, and I've, I've I've had to rip that out of websites because it's too hard to use. Advanced options panels, again, that's another plugin. Um, all these premium plugins come for free. So Revolution Slider, for example, and I recommend not using sliders as all. That will bring in lots of scripts and code loaded to your website. Um, so the issue with a lot of these, and I've, I've jumped into a client's websites that are broken, um, trying to fix something that's got so many different independent companies. So all these different, all this different functionality that is on this list here, that's all done by a different plugin that's done by a different company. So you've got this whole mash of different plugins by different companies, different styles. And what the theme does is they then code it to work all together seamlessly. However, it's just a just high risk as far as if one component breaks or doesn't work with the other. Also update cycles are gonna be quite different. And the, the person who's managing this theme or company can't actually manage any of that because it's, it's out of their control because they're all independent um, components. So in the context of something like Divi, it's one company that manage all the parts. So in that case, um, it's all consistent coding approach and coding a style. Um, and they're working to debug any relationship relationship thing. 
And the, these themes also have uh, a lot of code, code bloat. Now, something like Avada has been around for many years. So you've also got quite an um, old co code base. And they've spent a lot of time refining it so that it is fast. And yeah, sure, it is fast to download. Um, so yeah, these are the approach that I would avoid. Um, I would be choosing between a contemporary page builder or using more of a minimal uh, off-the-shelf theme or an off-the-shelf theme that it's coded all by one company. Um, they are the, the two approaches I'd recommend. These are Million Bells and Whistles, um, highest sellers of um, Vado, I would, um, I would avoid. Okay, and yeah, if, if um, a client comes to me with a website building one of them, I just won't work on it. I'll just say, sorry, I, I won't work on it because I have lifted the bonnet in the past and it's just such a mess um, to try and debug and to work with. Um, yeah, I just won't, won't be into that. Also another issue with these uh, all-in-one themes is that because they re-license, that means the updates come through the theme, not through the plugin directly. So if the theme hasn't been updated for six months, but the plugin itself has been updated in the last month, you're not going to get that update until the theme updates because they're re-licensing that the updates. So that will then slow the updates, which could cause issues um, just managing your, your software. Yeah, so I recommend, yeah, pay extra for the good plugins and the bundled concepts is not a good approach. Um, but here we go, you got $60 for Avado, um, Divi is $70 out of the box. So um, in that context, you know, you can pay an extra 10 bucks and just get far better technology. And now speaking of Divi and Elementor, so this is what I've moved my, um, my whole approach to. And Divi isn't perfect either. So I'm not saying this is a holy grail. More what I'm saying is that this, is a big step in the evolution of websites. So we've gone from having to custom code with very specialist skilled people to having tools that makes it easier. Uh, and then we had an advent of uh, page builders like Wix and Squarespace, which really allowed non-coding people to be able to build websites. And so Divi is now bringing that concept to WordPress. So you get all the benefits of WordPress, been able to plug in all the plugins, uh, and then have a drag and drop interface. Now I'll be doing a whole webinar on Divi, so um, we can go through that. Um, now Elementor is a competitor. Now there are other page builders. Um, I mentioned um, WP Bakery. I, I would ignore that one because it's simply out of date. It's such an old code base. Um, there's, um, there's a Beaver builder um, and there's a few others. Now I've, I, when I've done my research and then refine and redone my research. These two are really the two leaders in the market. And the difference between them, and you'll get people with Divi fans and Elemental fans, um, I really like to use an analogy, it's like Holden and Ford. So if you ever met a, a Ford person or a Holden person, they'll argue that their cars are better than the others. But really, they're American companies pretending to be Australian, building the same vehicles pretty much. Um, the, the difference between Holden and Ford really are so minimal. Yes, there are differences. And yes, there are differences between TV and Elementor, but they are quite minimal. So um, Elementor is getting a lot of traction because it's got a freemium business model. So a lot of people installing it are free. Um, whereas Divi, um, in my opinion, is a slightly better tool and it's getting better traction for that reason. Now, if you are, um, the thing with um, Divi is it's a page builder, but it's also a theme builder on top. So that means not only do you build the pages, but you build the theme layouts. So if you are choosing to use Elementor, there is an option if you buy Elementor that you get the theme builder with it. So I'd recommend that you buy the theme builder with the page builder, because that way you've got one company that's managing that code base, all the conflicts, all the updates, all the thing, it's actually one, one code base which is far, far better for updates and ongoing sustainability of your website. And again, I'll go through that in a bit more detail um, in the webinar. So now I'm going to go through how to select a theme in the same, because it's such an important decision. 
Um, so I'm going to do a bit of a mix of the way I used to themes, um, choose themes. So the first really important question you need to ask, and this is part of your briefing, is am I going to use a page builder like uh, Elementor or Divi here? Or am I going to custom build a high performance custom coded um, theme? So in that case, if you are going to do that, then you'll need to find professionals that can code that for you or learn a lot of code. Uh, but I wouldn't be learning the code unless you're wanting to become a professional web developer anyway. Or are you going to buy an off the shelf theme? So they're really the key question to start with. Because if you're going with a page builder, then I'd recommend you've got a choice of two here. So that narrows down your um, search. Yes, still do the research and always question um, consultants and um, experts in, in these fields. Because you may actually find a new tool that's, that's up and coming and it's better. And I am hopefully looking for a better a tool that will take out these two. Um, if you have a business case, for a high performance website, then um, these webinars are probably not for you. So you'd then go to a, web, a supplier um, or an off the shelf. Okay. Now the other thing to remember also with um, both Elegant and Elementor is that they come with templates as well. So it's a bit of the same type of concept as a theme. Um, oh, they're not gonna show it to us here. Um, layout, they call it a layout library. So in that context, it's the same, same idea as a theme, except for you can import the graphic design. So this is using Divi um, and Divi, both Divi and Elementor, they use a library. So that means that you can um, create elements that you reuse. This will import this stuff into your library. Okay, so you get the idea. So you can, you can, um, install templates in the same way as you think of a theme. So if you were going to choose a page builder, you can still have the same benefit of either getting free or paid template layouts for your website. Um, so that's a key thing to think about as well. If you choose one of those templates, then you're obviously locked into the page builder, um, for example. Um, okay, so in the context of um, how to choose a theme. I want to just jump back up to here to how do we choose a plugin. So it's similar to this. So you still do the thing, you'd still write a brief, work out your budget, you'd read, you could still do your research, um, top 10 themes, all that sort of stuff. Um, I'll make some extra comments to research, but I don't think top 10 WordPress themes is going to help you at all because you'll just end up with those Envato code bloats. Um, you can review some blogs, shortlist it, et cetera, et cetera. So now I'm going to talk, assuming that you know that process, because I use the same one, that we're going to, um, now we're going to do a few points specifically for themes. You need a brief. Um, specifically, you need a digital strategy. You need to figure out your user journey and your brand personality. So we, we've, we did that in a lot of previous webinars. We're talking about those side of things. Brand personality, for example, will help you decide what aesthetic and what, what does your theme look like? Is it a very busy, busy corporate um, specific theme? Or is it a bit more open and a lot more negative space? Um, is it real big font sizes so it's easy to read? Those sort of stuff. So your brand personality should dictate the aesthetics and the graphic design. The user journey, um, also how much information do you need on different pages, how are people going to actually jump from Facebook into your website, but so then when they're there, how are they going to navigate your website? So that will also be important on what theme you choose. Another important question is what does your content look like? So if we look at a lot of the examples of the, the um, themes, you'll notice that they all seem to be images and um, pictures and things. So if you go to the photography website that I showed you and you go, oh, that's such a beautiful theme, but you've got crappy photography, then that's just your theme, your website then gonna look crappy. So at which point you'd be looking at more of a theme that minimizes photography a bit and has a bit more um, uh, copy. Or if you're more copy driven, you'd have obviously more copy. If you're more of a, uh, a written blog approach, you're gonna have a different template to then if you're more of a visual approach. 
So your content is really key. And I do um, come across a lot of people that um, have a, they choose a theme that doesn't sync up with their type and their type of content. Um, they're trying to look like this, but their content looks like that. So that's really important. And how are you displaying and managing your content? So, um, you know, do you need image galleries? Are, are you managing it like a blog? Um, do you need categorization, that sort of stuff? Okay, so some additional considerations when choosing a theme. Now, this is really important. Do not be distracted by pretty photos. Um, most people choosing a theme don't really know what they're looking at. They, so hopefully you're learning through this webinar. Um, so they will just look at the pretty pictures. So pretty much the theme that has the prettiest pictures will win. And um, so I, it's really important that when you're looking at a theme that you blank out those images because they're going to be your images. What you're looking at is how they display the images and what the images like look like in context, but not the images themselves. Else you'll choose a theme that has really high end photography and a really not necessarily a good theme. Okay, so uh, when we're searching for keywords, um, with the plugins, we were actually saying top 10 calendar plugins. In this context, you'd be looking for a specialist focus. So for example, musician, artist, medical center. So I was doing um, some work for a client that was setting up a, um, a small um, medical center. So we searched for medical center. And what was coming back was themes that had graphic design and aesthetics that would suit that. Uh, and the photography ones that I showed you as an example before. But also mix it up. So you might be a not-for-profit, and if you search for not-for-profit and you're noticing that all the templates coming up are all the same, you know, this is just a stereotyped, boring approach to the way that we're going to approach a website design for not-for-profits. You go, well, maybe our brand personality is we're a bit funky. So maybe you start searching for musician themes or artist themes because the content, the, the theme is just the vibe of it. it. You can put your own content in. So if you get a really funky looking website that's designed for musicians, but you put your not-for-profit content in there, it will still, it will look funky and cool as if it was a musician. Um, if your brand personality, if you're running say a finance campaign, um, you may look up business um, themes, uh, corporate themes, so that way you can really brand your campaign as being very corporate. So yeah, have a look at the not-for-profit themes and not-for-profit approaches, but I'd also recommend that you jump out of that and think about, after you've done that, get out of your system, and then think about your brand personality and then what would be another genre that would, would reflect what you're trying to do. Um, now, if you're using an off-the-shelf theme, at that point you'd buy it. Uh, if I'm using a page builder, this research is really useful still because um, I can then cut out the font because it's all open source, right? I can pull out what fonts they're using. I can pull out what font typography sizes. I can pull out their colors. And I did have a case where um, a client had bought an off the shelf theme and I simply rebuilt that entirely in Divi. Um, so it looked exactly the same, but then they had the, the functionality of Divi. Um, and I think that's really really still a relevant useful part of the process is if even if you're using a page builder the off-the-shelf research is still really important um responsive and mobile so if i grab my screen here i scroll back up and i drag it so this is a different screen size and see how it's all adjusting and different um, this is called responsive and how this menu works on a mobile which it's not on the desktop well i better test that oh, here we go um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So you really want to um, make sure that whatever theme you're building, uh, you're, 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 um, you're considering works really well on a mobile, works well on a tablet. Now, because there's such different screen sizes, you can always just do this and give it a good test. And a good theme will just adapt and look really cool um, depending on what you're doing. So, you know, let's look at the TV website. Um, let's go to that homepage. Um, let's go to Elementor. So if I do that to it, what's it gonna do? Okay, that's still looking good. What's it gonna do? That, see, that looks, still looks good on a mobile. And this one here, let's stop trying to log in. That there's looking good on a mobile as well. So both of those pass the test. 
Uh, but really key when you're choosing a theme that it must be responsive. Does the theme have um, support for specific plugins? So if you're using a popular plugin like WooCommerce, um, most themes, a lot of themes will have aesthetics and support for WooCommerce. Some themes are designed specifically just for WooCommerce. So in that kind of, if it's just as if it's a small plugin that you're using, then that doesn't really matter. But if you're using a, like a very specific dedicated um, plugin, that's the key. So for example, my map example, that's the main point of the website's that plugin. So I need a theme that's going to work well or support that um, plugin. Be very careful of bad freemium. So I introduced freemium saying it's on a spectrum of um, some really good stuff and some really dodgy approaches. Now the dodgy end of the scale is used a lot in themes. So what they'll do is they'll go, you know, install my theme, it's free. And then if you want us to start changing things, we're going to charge you for this, we're going to charge you for that. Um, I'm not really keen on the freemium business model for themes. I think like the Divi is you just pay outright one fee with Elementor. It's um, this much is free and then you pay for the rest. It's just a really um, line in the sand. So you can choose whether to go over that line versus like this bit costs a bit of money. That bit costs a bit of money. It just gets really quite messy. So be really careful about what, what the fees are. And then the important thing also with plugins is the long-term viability. So are they doing regular updates? What is their business model? Are they making a heap of money? So for example, if I jump to um, Echo, this is $60, $59, let's round up. And they've made 2,553 sales. And how long has it been going for? Um, update, created in June 19. So that's a fair bit of money they've made. And if they're running multiple themes, then that's a sustainable business. So you think, well, they're probably going to be in business in the long term, and therefore they're more likely to do updates, and then that's much more safer bet. If you look at their themes and they're not selling many themes, and uh, or the specific theme you're looking at, it's not selling much. It will be probably costing that company more to maintain it than they are making from it. At which point they'll probably discontinue it, and then your theme's not being updated, and you'll be forced to change it in the future. So I've, um, I do that every now and then I'll, I'll need to refit a theme for a client who's bought a theme a couple of years ago, that's not been updated and therefore it's out of date. So we need to um, update that. Um, because it's really important to keep your software updated. Okay. So now I've got yourself a theme, I'm just going to introduce child themes. Now, this is best practice if you're customizing themes. So in this context, um, there's, there's two main, there's three main things that you're gonna be customizing on a theme. Um, CSS, now CSS was the language that controls the fonts and the typography and that sort of stuff. That can be overridden usually in the theme itself. Um, and also WordPress um, usually, um, has a bit where you can put custom CSS in there. It's generally better to actually put the CSS in that theme system than it is as a, in the um, template system because uh, it helps when you're using caches and that sort of stuff. Now, if you're making any changes though to the PHP or the HTML to the themes, you need to then code directly into the theme. There's also another type of document in a WordPress theme called functions. And this is programming language. And we use it here and there um, so for example, we use it a bit in WooCommerce. If we want to hide things or move things or um, add bits and pieces, there's a whole language in WooCommerce um, called functions where we can just put a line of code and we'll add it in here and there. So we need to edit that function document. So if we code the theme itself and it gets updated, then what happens is that your, um, your updates get overridden. So that's very bad practice. So what we do is we set up a child theme. So basically a child theme is set up, is dependent and overrides the parent theme. So another way of looking at it is it has, your website runs using two themes. The main one, which has most of the code is the parent and then the child one, which only has the little bit of customizations that you have in it. 
So when you update your parent, you can just update that as normal. It won't affect any customizations. And so that's best practice. That means that you can update regularly and then your customizations stay um, unchanged. Then if there is any issue or conflict with an update, there's only a few um, documents in there that you coded so you can easily figure out what you've done wrong or what you can update. Now, if you're working with a developer and you're getting any customizations done, if they're not making a theme, a child theme, you ask them why. It's, uh, it's very likely that they're not a very competent developer. That's a really good sign. Um, child themes are basic um, and you would only need to learn how to use them if you're doing development. So I'll leave it at, at this. Um, however, if you are working with a developer, it's really, really important that they're using a child theme. And that also is for page builders as much as any other type of thing. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about what I call complete apps. And this is where we're pushing themes to the limit. Um, now in that context, when I was talking about back up here, we're talking about um, the mashups, um, the highest selling themes of um, theme forest and how I don't like them. Um, I'm going to contradict myself and in this context, because if you're using all that complexity and mashup just to build a basic website, I think it's a bad approach. But if you're using that complexity to mash up a whole software system, then I'm much more open minded to that. So I'm going to use the example of listable. Move me out of the way. So I'll move that out of the way. So listable is a theme that has plugins, dependent plugins. So some of these are paid plugins. So as well as paying the cost of the theme, you also then have to pay for the premium plugins. What this is is an off-the-shelf business. Um, so if you're just say that you move to a, a town on the on the beach you're doing a sea change and you want to set up a business, a tourism business. Um, this theme will allow you to do it off the, out of the box. What, all, what it has is um, mapping. Uh, people can add their own business listings. You can have free listings. You can have paid listings, et cetera, et cetera. So in this context, it's got a really good search filtering system. Um, now we created a website off that tool called cofinder.com.au and what this website wants to do is it wants to help you find co-working spaces um, not being used at the moment with COVID but it was all the rage just before so in this case we can type in any um, place we can do a search we've got different um, categories search um, so it automatically maps them, it does the cluster context, we can um, filter them. So this is a minimal use of the tool. You can also have a full booking engine for any of these. So you may um, want to be an agent for these businesses and do bookings for them. Uh, or you may have paid listings, all that sort of stuff. So this is a complete off the shelf um, business. Um, and if we have a look at the pricing, Um, there you go, one time purchase for $105. We're looking, if you wanted to develop that from scratch, you're looking at 30 to 100 grand um, in development costs. So this allows you to rapid prototype and to, um, to quickly build stuff really cheaply. Uh, and there's quite a few there. So in the context, I um, mean, this listable is also on, um, Invada here. So in that context, if you're looking at these themes with bell, lots of bells and whistles, I'll be saying, do the bells and whistles do something? So in the in the listable example, yes, they are doing something. They're very they're specifically piecing all the bits together to have a seamless um, business um, approach versus just building a website, if that makes sense. And I'm going to show you another example, and I'm going to jump back to the graph paper press. So this is, I introduced this as a theme, as a theme um, boundary. And um, I've been recommending these people for years. I would like their work. And when I looked at it today um, for, the, for this webinar, I noticed that they've, I scroll down here, 
and they've got an integrated e-commerce system. So in that case, you can sell photos, you sell prints, you can sell membership plans. So what we are now doing is as well as having a beautifully designed website, we are now um, offering photographers or, art or artists their core business model, which is selling photography or artwork and selling prints. So as a photographer, you're like, okay, so this actually does the businesses that I need. Um, so if I go and view your features, it does all the things, et cetera, et cetera. So I looked at it in a bit more. I looked at it in a bit more detail. And then what I, rec what I came across was that this is an actually an application. So if I scroll down, um, Cell Media is a plugin. So I'm going to jump to the WordPress repository. Is a plugin. So this company um, saw what was happening um, with what with with the future of theme development. And they're saying if we keep making themes, we're going to be out of business sooner enough. So then they started saying we want to then enable our um, clients or photographers and artists to actually run their own businesses. So they created this this plugin, um, which so their theme actually works. Um, integrated very tightly it means that it's one company building that so if you're if you're running a photography business this would be a great uh, option because you're one business running the whole code base um, and here they are against some other um, examples I mean I haven't used this software it's just me looking at the um, description and what they're doing is that they're also running a freemium model so you can say I'm not even going to use your themes I'm just gonna use your software and you can you get all the stuff on the left for free and then on the right you pay for like 150 a year um, so this is also a great example of using freemium business model but then also integrating um, a well-designed themes with um, the functionality of plugins so they're using a plugin and a theme it's all tightly integrated now i'd assume here that they'd probably be using woocommerce to do their transactions um, this would be a guess. Maybe they don't. I haven't actually, I haven't actually looked at it in detail, but they probably use a few other plugins that plug in to make that work. So it does get very um, vague between what is a theme, what is a plugin. Um, however, yeah, hopefully it makes a lot more sense through through this. And there are quite a lot of example, other examples of um, just out of the box full business models. Ooh. All right, so now I'm just going to just run into a little bit of uh, housekeeping, and I'm going to sh talk about um, keeping theme keeping themes tidy. So in that context, 2020 is the default. So let me just jump into a, um, a WordPress theme. Uh, sorry, WordPress install. So if we go appearance themes, on oh, installation I didn't run that through, so you can just add new. So here we go, we've got the 2020, the 2019, 2017. These are what I ship with WordPress. Now you'll notice that 2019 is like awful. Um, the new one's pretty awful as well. But it would suit certain, certain use case scenarios. Now it's really important to understand that if, if WordPress um, fails, if your theme fails, it will revert back to 2020. So it's really important that you um, have one of the default themes in there. So let me jump to a site that said, so this is the buddy, this is my action skills website. And if I go to appearance themes. Okay, so this is what I recommend um, in your themes is that you have your, this is the parent theme. So this is Divi. Then I've got my child theme and then I've got 2020. Now it's really important to have 2020 or a WordPress theme in there because if Divi or Divi or my child theme fail, it needs 2020 to roll back. I also need that theme in there if I'm testing, if I've got conflicts, that sort of stuff. Then delete every other theme out of there. You don't need any other theme. I'll log into some websites and when people have been researching themes, they've installed them to test. And then out of that, there's like 50 themes in there or you know, 10 themes in there. They're, they are all security risks because they've all got their own code. So yeah, delete all the themes. It also means all your backups and all, and all your upgrades are also gonna be upgrading those themes, backing up those themes. So this is what a, a good theme um, will look like in your WordPress is you've got your parent theme, your child theme, 
and your default theme. You may not have a child theme. Now, updating themes uh, and plugins. So you can see here on this website, we've got three plugins to update. And um, if I go up to dashboard, we've got three Soko updates. Okay, so here we go. We've got all the plugins that are updated that need updating and all the themes. All my themes are up to date, but I'll just list them the exact same way. So then I can just click on the ones I want and update it. Now I'm not updating Lightspeed Cache because it was buggy and um, I'm waiting for an upgrade before I do that. Okay, so the final thing I'm gonna show you is when things go wrong. So this is manually controlling plugins and themes. So sometimes you may have a complete fail and that means that your website crashes or you've got a conflict. So you install a plugin or a theme and then it's just broken your website. And you're like, oh, I can't log into this screen because um, my website's broken. So if you can't log into your screen, uh, you've got plugin problems, I'll show you what to do. So in the uh, basics, WordPress, uh, sorry, the Internet Basics um, webinar, I talked about hosting. And what, uh, what this screen you're looking at at the moment, this is when you buy hosting, you'll be given a control panel. This is cPanel, the brand, there are others. And this gives you um, various control functionality of your website. But in this context, I'm going to go to file manager. And you can also access this through a technology called FTP, file transfer protocol. Uh, this is just the easiest way. So amongst all this, I know that my website's in public underscore HTML. Your host may be different, but you can ask your host, I'll let you know. So in here we have our WordPress content. Um, this specific one's a little bit messy. This is an old website. So what we have here is we have the WordPress files. And then in here, we've got a folder called wp-content, wp-content. So go into here. Now in here, we have a, a plugin a folder called plugins and a folder called themes. So if I jump into here, and in here, you'll see that I've got my parent theme here. Then I've got my child theme. And then I have um, three of the, um, of the default themes. So I can delete two of those. Now, if I've got an issue with a theme, what I can do is I can grab, in this case, the parent and the child, if you've got a child theme, and then I click move. What I do is then move it out of there. So I'm just gonna move it one directory upwards. I'm not gonna do this now, um, it's a live site. And then I did just hit move files. What that does is then WordPress only will register a theme if it's in the themes folder. It will only register a plugin if it's in the plugins folder. So if you remove those themes or plugins from the themes and plugins folder, WordPress just disables them. So if you've got a, if you've got a problematic uh, plugin or a problematic theme and it's crashed your website, if it's problematic and you can access your admin, then you can just turn it off there, that's better. But if, if, all, if all's gone bad and sideways, you can come in here and just move it out of there. In which case, you um, will disable it and WordPress will then reset and then you'll be able to log in and then go back to debugging it. So that's a real a key important thing with managing plugins. Also, this is also an interesting um, screen to learn as well because sometimes when you're installing a plugin, the you may be limited with your upload size. So it may not let you upload a big plugin or you may have issues um, installing it any other way. So in that context, you can simply just go upload, drag your zip here, and then you can upload via here. Now, if you upload a theme to the theme folder, it will automatically install. So that's just what your WordPress installer is doing. So then you can then get the zip. If this was a zip, there's a extract button up the right here and they'll allow you to extract it. It also means sometimes if um, plugins or themes don't delete properly or you've got some corruption and it won't delete, um, you can come in here and manually de delete it. So this screen's really, this is for if your WordPress interface fails, is not working for any reason, 
then this is where you come to um, override or fix that. So in this context, I can also do my housekeeping and I'm going to take out, uh, because I only want to have the three themes in there, then I'm going to delete those. And confirm. And there they're deleted and gone. So I do these webinars, I'm giving them away for free because I'm really keen to get um, not-for-profits and activists um, skilled up in these essential skills. Um, they're by donation. So there's a link to the donation form on the email that I send out. Uh, if that's not appropriate to where you're at, then I'd really appreciate if you um, send me um, a review on Facebook or like the social media, make comments on the social media or to promote this through your networks. That'd be much appreciated. And I'll see you at future webinars. Thank you.